uh, as Athena said, the assignment of the geology and composition of the surface, which would assume uh, about half the audience's work. Um, so I've decided to narrow it to a picture of what is the overall stratigraphy and geology, geologic setting of uh, Titan's surface. And so um, the focus here is going to be on the uh, distribution of bright and dark materials, um, how they uh, can be interpreted with a variety of data. Principally, I'll talk about uh, DISSER radar and VIMS. Um, I will exclude here the lakes and seas because they're going to be topics of a whole uh, menagerie of uh, talks throughout this uh, conference. So, so basically this is the dry land and how it is laid out on, on the surface of Titan, in, in my view at least. So we start out um, with Titan's bulk density, uh, um, 1.9 uh, uh, is its specific gravity and that indicates that water ice is got to be a major component of the interior of Titan. And it's inescapable uh, that there will be the geologic migration of water ice to the surface. Although we are almost certain that water ice has to control the fundamental geological fabric of the crust, the direct uh, definitive spectroscopic determination of its existence at the surface remains elusive. That'll be the part of the message. And so the basic uh, model that I'm going to propose and describe to you is that fundamentally there is a water ice substrate that forms the uh, topography seen by, for instance, radar, and that overlaying that substrate are these hydrocarbon rich mantles, both of bright materials and of the dark dunes, which are principally not water ice rich, but rich in uh, hydrocarbons, nitriles, uh, some complex uh, uh, organic uh, 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 chemistry, and certainly not simple organics. Otherwise, you would have seen a whole bunch of them showing up in, in the, uh, for instance, the GCMS and the DISSER uh, surface data. The, um, so on top of that, however, uh, we know from the radar, uh, radiometry and those investigations that extensive uh, exposures of solid, non-porous water ice must be rare. There is actually only one or two places where we think they, they could exist. Uh, it's remarkably uh, uniform and bland in the radar radiometry, as I shall show you. And finally, um, the, uh, the aerosol precipitations uh, basically uh, supply this material to the mantles and they are reworked into coarser uh, dark grains that constitute the dunes the f and fine uh, surface deposits which are the bright materials which are argu arguably uh, a variety of lighter uh, hydrocarbons, uh, even ices have been proposed, um, acetylene perhaps, a variety of things. And those must be under active redistribution. Otherwise, the surface would be coated and, uh, and bland. So what did we know uh, before, uh, what did we think we knew, know before uh, Cassini? Uh, that there would be a, a tremendous amount of material supplied to the surface from the atmosphere. It's one of the few places in the solar system where both the interior and the atmosphere actively contribute to the surface geologic materials in a significant and major way. So on the one hand, we have um, a whole range of, uh, of uh, derivatives of the uh, photochemistry of methane and other things in the atmosphere raining down on the surface, expected to accumulate uh, um, order of a kilometer of material or more. And from the uh, interior, we uh, have long thought, uh, starting out with uh, models in the, uh, um, in the 80s and 90s, uh, Dave Stevenson and, and others, and those have been expanded, that the, uh, the interior must consist of uh, 
uh, layers of, of water and water ice, uh, which are mobilized uh, perhaps with abundant ammonia that uh, lowers the, uh, the melting point and produces uh, um, fluids that can be cryovolcanically active at the surface. Uh, and technism would breach these uh, crust and allow a variety of these uh, ammonia water and, and perhaps methane clathrate uh, uh, fluids and, and uh, charged uh, eruptions to reach the surface. Um, and I should say uh, that I'm going to talk about the fact that um, these three mantles or three uh, basic uh, uh, facies in the geology uh, are now evident at the surface, but the Earth-based observations, um, uh, actually Caitlin Griffith and, and Athena Kustenis with their colleagues um, in the... Uh, 90s and, and up until five years ago have, uh, have shown that uh, the, uh, the darker regions are consistent with mixtures of water ice, dirty water ice was the description, but not the bright regions, that they are actually uh, inconsistent with uh, water ice. So the first lesson to, uh, to a newcomer to Titan is don't look at the bright materials and think ice, water ice. You can think ice, but but not water ice. Okay, and so looking through the atmosphere of Titan is something of a challenge to do spectroscopy. These are some of the, the windows, uh, albeit this is using Irwin's uh, data, so uh, we can uh, improve this and, reduce, and make it even more difficult to see the surface. Um, this is a, a region of, uh, of uns well, let's say argument rather than uncertainty. I think Athena's certain she knows what that is, but uh, uh, maybe Paul Hain will uh, come forward with uh, some discussions of that later in this uh, conference. But some of these windows in, in the methane, particularly uh, these uh, between one and two microns, and also the five micron region, uh, the atmosphere is quite uh, transparent to, uh, to VIMS on, on a smoggy scale. And so that's where we uh, can do, uh, albeit very limited, spectroscopy. And it's broadband spectroscopy because we really can't get at uh, the uh, uh, definitive uh, uh, absorption bands, something that's left for the future of Titan missions. So mapping some of these windows, this is some, uh, an illustration from some McCord work, uh, shows the, that we're doing spectroscopy again through a a picket fence in which you only get a few uh, uh, narrow slots between the pickets to look through. And, but there are some uh, important absorption features in a variety of, of ices, particularly water ice. You can see that the two micron and the uh, one and a half micron absorb uh, windows actually sample uh, the, uh, uh, the bands of water quite nicely. And in fact, that was used in in the early, uh, earlier ground-based work that I spoke of to, uh, to elucidate the, uh, uh, some ideas for the models of the, of the surface. Well, coming back to Cassini, um, McCord's uh, early look at the VIMS data, McCord et al., in 2006, um, showed that, consistent with the Earth-based interpretations, that the dark materials um, show absorptions, depressions, in these uh, uh, water uh, band regions, consistent, again, with the dark regions being mixtures of water ice and tholins, but the bright regions uh, don't display that. Uh, um. Now, others have noted that uh, water ice uh, can be, its spectral behavior can be mimicked by um, other compounds, notably organics and nitriles, and so, that's what casts suspicion on this identification because we don't have good um, uh, spectroscopic data to actually characterize the bands themselves. So moving on, uh, the VIMS data was used uh, to map the planet in, the, in these bands I noted, which were, in this case, 1.6, 2, and 5 microns. And so a whole plethora of color units pop out. And the question here is, what do they, uh, what do they constitute? 
Well, by doing some correlations um, between the uh, radar observations, these are SAR, uh, um, Cassini uh, radar SAR images, synthetic aperture radar images of uh, a region around the Huygens landing site, which is in here. We'll, a number of people will talk about uh, these data later. And Synlab Crater. And for the most part, when you looked at this, and Marty and I first looked at that and said, there isn't any correlation. Um, there's like they're seeing completely different things. But if you start to look through this carefully, you start to see at least some, some things. Well, you see these patterns uh, recur there. And these uh, bright islands uh, stand out here. And there are some dark uh, patterns in here that you see in here. And what is the correlation? It turns out the only thing that's really correlating here are the large fields of, of dunes that were discovered in the radar images. And they stand out as the, this brownish unit. Now, why are they brownish? Um, the uh, color composites that are used here um, are using 2.6 red, green, blue as 2, 1.6, and 1.3. So 1.3 is a place where water ice is less absorptive. And because blue is, is there, then this is, this is high where, where water ice, and this is low uh, where water ice. So green and red are depressed. Blue is enhanced. And that's the, the bluish uh, patterns you see in here. The brown, basically, which are the dark brown units, are depressed in all wavelengths fairly uniformly. And so the contribution made here uh, in this analysis in which we were comparing the two was the strong correlation between the dark um, brown unit seen in VIMS and this, or the 5 to 1. 1.6, either one, composites, uh, illustrates uh, that uh, the dark units are broken into at least two classes. The dunes, which do not exhibit this evidence, albeit uh, uh, inconclusive, of water ice, and the, and the blue units that you see here um, that do. Um, notable, and we'll come back to this, and Christoph Slotan will talk about it, is that the, uh, the landing site uh, of Huygens basically consists of the bright units and the dark blue units. And, and the dark blue units are the planes that we landed on. And, and so there is um, at least a, uh, a correspondence with uh, what Bruno uh, was talking about this morning in, in the fact that there is strong suggestion in the district data of uh, water ice. And I'll come back to that. So looking at the distribution of these uh, um, brown, um, blue, and bright units in a cluster diagram that um, we did some time ago, it was remarkable that if you plotted uh, uh, just a cluster analysis in the 2 micron, 1.6, and 1.3 micron window, you see this and this thing. But if you rotate it in a particular way, its three-dimensionality virtually vanishes. And what this is telling you is that there is extremely strong correlation between the 2 micron and the 1.6 micron bands. Again circumstantial and not proof of water ice, but the fact that those bands uh, uh, basically are driven together, uh, it, it would be uh, surprising that something else was mimicking it so well. Um, so let's come to the, some of the other units. The, uh, the bright and the blue units, there are cases where there are correlations between radar and, and VIMS, but they are complex. Some, in most cases where we see these bluish patterns uh, peeking through the bright materials, they're associated with either uh, fluvial scour, aeolian scour. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, a whole uh, uh, set of uh, papers have emerged, uh, uh, Barnes uh, um, and uh, Jenny Radabaugh have looked at these things and concluded in the mountainous terrains, again, this uh, um, three component. By the way, you can see a little tiny patch of dunes here. We blow them up in radar, and there they are, the dark brown again. Everywhere we look, um, well, almost everywhere we look, uh, we see this correspondence. So what is going on 
that causes these, this strong correlation between what we see in the radar and the dark brown dunes, but elsewhere there's basically no correlation. It's like they weren't even imaging the same uh, planet or, or moon, whichever. Um, and so one idea would it be, and, and the idea I present here, is that the radar is seeing through these uh, bright materials to a large extent, not through the dunes, but sees them. And the uh, VIMS instrument is seeing the deposits and the superficial coloration uh, in the upper uh, few microns. So another piece of information comes, as I mentioned earlier, from the radar uh, radiometry, which uh, um, is a passive mode of the radar, uh, one of its five modes or something of that order, um, in which uh, data were used basically to map uh, the planet, a combination of, of, uh, of uh, low resolution uh, radiometry coupled with some polarization pairs where two different passes of the SAR were accomplished uh, um, with different uh, polarizations. And, and so from that they've assembled, a, uh, Jensen et al. assembled a map of a large fraction. And one of the things that's striking here, now dielectric constant or effective, effective dielectric constant, if there were ex extensive exposures of water ice, you'd see red and yellow all over this map. In fact, we find only a very few places and what's striking to me is the uniformity of an average sort of property across a whole host of terrains. That says that the physical properties, namely that these are porous, fluffy um, materials, mask their true uh, composition. And, um, and perhaps Synlap is one of the few places that, uh, that water ice is, is exposed in a substantial uh, uh, way. Um, I thought I'd put this in because uh, uh, for me it really uh, brings home the message that the, uh, uh, the Huygens trajectory, descent trajectory was very unlike what we expected. Um, you've heard this morning that uh, we turned the wrong way, we rotated that way, we swung this way, um, but not only that, but we didn't blow as much as we expected to, particularly in the lower part of the atmosphere. But by the time we got to an elevation of, of below 20 kilometers, this, this, the probe was coming almost straight down. And this presented a rather bizarre uh, kind of stereo uh, for these regions. So this shows a stereo pair of, uh, that Bob West uh, showed the, this morning of this region of the dendritic highlands. Uh, but this has to be a, a, a stereoscopist that, uh, that has his eyes uh, uh, planted in his forehead and his mouth. Uh, Randy uh, Kirk's created such people. We, we've not cloned them yet, but they are, they'd be ideal for uh, studying these uh, stereo pairs uh, acquired in this fashion. Nonetheless, the, the plotters uh, could manage that. This is what uh, Bob West showed this morning. Again, he mentioned the, the really rugged uh, terrains that uh, we find in these, uh, in these regions. This is only an area of, uh, of roughly three by five kilometers. So it's a tiny area, but the total relief here is a couple hundred meters. And so the uh, slopes in many of these valleys are uh, in the neighborhood of 30 degrees, as Bob mentioned, close to the angle of repose. But, so here are the flows of these uh, uh, channels down into the lowlands from these higher terrains. But if we look at the flow directions across these terrains, particularly in the low altitude uh, disser data, which uh, showed a whole uh, plethora of, uh, of fluvial uh, carv carved channels down through here, the flow direction actually truncates the flows coming down from the highlands. So there have been vast floods, in this case, from uh, southwest to northeast across this terrain. And so the story is, uh, is a bit more complex than methane rain running down the hills. There have been uh, floods issued across the plains uh, uh, and probably not in the terribly uh, recent past. So, um, 
As I mentioned, uh, this weak correlation between uh, the radar and VIMS um, uh, shows, nonetheless, that the, the uh, Huygens landing site is a, is, a re is a mixture of these bright and the dark blue units. And that's consistent with, um, here's a, a cartoon. The nearest dunes that you see up in here are the radar dunes. They're about 30 kilometers north. And again, other people are going to talk about these, uh, both Randy and, uh, um, and Christoph, I suspect. But down in the landing site, uh, we're in the region of these bright and, uh, and uh, blue, uh, dark blue units. These uh, dunes are the largest uh, extents of them in the region is up in this corner. And that's the, this dark brownish unit. Um, other studies using the VIMS uh, uh, data also concluded that um, the Huygens landing site, this is from Rodriguez et al., uh, what is a region uh, in the close vicinity of the landing site in which water ice uh, and the bright units are the, uh, these bright hydrocarbon units are, are the uh, evident. So here is one spectrum um, from the surface, uh, uh, the red curve. And um, the uh, mixed in here is a model in which uh, um, Bizarre's uh, bright and dark tholins, in this case, uh, were mixed with uh, water ice. And as Bruno said, that we add, need to add some strange bluish thing that we don't know, hocus pocus. But uh, the thing that uh, Tomasco et al. noted that even though this uh, 1.5 micron band fits nicely with water ice. There are other bands that should be there if this is, in fact, a coarse um, uh, surface so of water ice. And so inconclusive. Um, but uh, more recent analysis by uh, uh, Schroeder and, uh, Kel in this case, Keller et al. in 2008, and also Schroeder and Keller, uh, did a very nice piece of work, not only looking at um, um, the reflectance at the landing site itself, which uh, using bidirectional, uh, um, basically solving for the reflectivity uh, from the surface lamp, which illuminated the uh, surface at very close to zero phase angle. And they saw a surface uh, albedo that was effectively three times what Tomasco et al. saw. And that is consistent with a, uh, a Heiligen and Schein backscatter fairy castle kind of uh, structure uh, consistent perhaps with this very soft uh, uh, few millimeters of uh, material that uh, that uh, was seen in the, that John uh, talked about uh, at the end of the, the morning. But one of the th things that uh, Schroeder et al. added to this, I'm sorry, Keller et al. added to this, was to look at the down-looking infrared uh, uh, data and showed that even though uh, this, again, we're looking even now through these methane uh, spic uh, picket fences, um, that there is not the kind of depression that would be uh, um, expected for water ice in the bright terrains. And so this, again, is consistent with the bright terrains being relatively water ice uh, uh, free. So I've got three minutes, and I'm on my summary and conclusions. So in summary, a variety of observations su suggest water ice must be a major constituent of Titan surface, but its definitive detection uh, spectroscopically has not yet been uh, proven. So we still are going to be in this argument with uh, Roger Clarks of the world that there's other things that could, could make this happen. Uh, the Earth-based VIMS and DISSER uh, spectra all consistently show that water ice is consistent with the dark regions but the bright regions are not consistent. Rather, they are consistent with hydrocarbons, whether solid, acetylene, or methane, ethane ice, if we can get the temperature right. The, um, but added to that message is the comparison between VIMS and radar shows that the dark units themselves are divisible into two other units, and perhaps more, uh, which uh, we characterize, uh, verbalize as the dark brown unit and the dark blue unit. And as I've described to you, uh, 
the dark um, uh, brown unit it correlates strongly with the radar dunes and sits uh, uh, deposits laid over the, the top. And so back to the, the basic uh, geologic stratigraphic model is that uh, the crust, the surficial um, crust that makes up the topography of the planet is made up of a dark uh, blue water ice substrate. Um, and that is formed by a variety of cryovolcanic processes that we've seen in a number of, of data sets and um, principally in the radar data sets and also altered by impact. Um, and those are overlaid by um, these hydrocarbon nitrile rich bright materials and uh, these dark hydrocarbon rich dunes. So that, uh, but the, the uh, um, extensive surface exposures of this uh, substrate of water ice, at least as solid sheets, are extremely rare. Um, the major forces I mentioned that form the, the water ice sub, uh, crust are the, uh, are the um, endogenic processes and aerosol precipitation that supplies these materials must be in balance with an active environment of wind and methane rain that is continually uh, erasing and rearranging and reprocessing those aerosols. Thank you. Larry, uh, where did the one kilometer of uh, hydrocarbons go? I mean, I can see that you reprocess the surface, but it doesn't take the hydrocarbons away. Well, uh, presumably the hydrocarbons get uh, uh, processed. Clearly the dune materials, with which Ralph, uh, I think, rightly uh, um, assert, uh, concluded, had to be of very coarse uh, grain materials, 300 uh, microns or so. It, those would fall out of the atmosphere like bricks. And so there must be chemical and physical processing going on continually, and it must be quite rapid. Um, and so one of the real mysteries left for the future is where are all the simple hydrocarbons that should have been in the GCMS data, should have been in the uh, uh, district spectra we ought to see in VIMS. Um, if they're there, uh, they have been uh, processed. Um, most likely they've been processed in the atmosphere and at the surface rapidly into more complex hydrocarbons. The ethane and, and methane, um, well, it's in the subsurface, it's in the polar regions. So. But, but I was always to the fact that we should have a layer of those of a kilometer. On top of the ice, essentially. Right. Well, I think, Dr. Roland, you're going to explain where all that went this afternoon. <laughs> I don't know, sir. Well, if you have a porous, um, yeah. you know, substrate, then they can also... They're in the aquifers. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Oded's going to also talk about that. I'd like to ask you two questions. Um, do you think there is some evidence of catastrophic floods from, for example, the, the craters, the few craters that have been identified in the surface of Titan? And uh, what type of features uh, can be observed surrounding these craters? Well, I think um, the, there's a, a debate going on whether or not the, uh, the west to east uh, um, erosional flows that we have seen are aeolian or fluvial or both. And, um, and I'll bet you that they're both. Um, but I, the um, patterns that we saw at the... Um, at roughly 200 meters elevation in Disser, you could see uh, um, fine carvings and uh, grooving and benches, uh, uh, flows that cross cut and drop between uh, horizons and so forth. And those are uh, uh, classically uh, characteristic of uh, higher density flows than, than, than wind. But whether or not the forms that we see protruding through largely uh, these dune fields in the form of uh, what I suspect to be uh, water ice rocky highlands that have been shaped into uh, um, streamlined islands is formed by uh, wind, the wind or, or fluvial erosions that uh, is arguable. I, I believe that both of them are active. 
wouldn't you expect, if this is a mantling, if a bright material is mantling, wouldn't you expect perhaps to see uh, mass wasting re revealing darker material underneath this mantling deposit? Right. And if, Unless, we, if we don't see it, is it, is it telling yeah, us that's the a puzzle the and, uh, or the resolution of our observations? That's, that's a puzzle. My uh, colleague, uh, Captain Kirk, and I have argued about this for the last three years. So what you're describing is the highlands north of the landing site uh, exhibit this extremely rugged terrain, and we see these dark, uh, lee incised uh, valleys. Now, um, some folks are going to argue that uh, the dark valleys are actually uh, a shading effect from lighting. Um, I think you see some large ponds in the, in the bottoms of those, uh, some of those valleys that suggest there really is some dark material in there. So what is the explanation? Either the bright materials end up getting centered in place and so that they form a cap that's somewhat resistant and or they're quite porous so that the methane rains sink through them, hit the waterized substrate, coalesce into the valleys, and then have sufficient force to erode those out. And so as in all geologic problems, uh, the geophysical model of red and green blocks doesn't always work. Right, S a similar case in Xanadu as well, where we have high, yeah. which is bright and also high, high source. Okay, the last question from Benny. Uh, there, there have been several references, you and Bob West, for example, to the, the angle of repose on Titan. I don't recollect any discussion of measurements that yielded what those angles of repose were. Right, but most solid materials, uh, the angle of repose, uh, if they're in a granular form, is the order of 28 to 37 degrees, or Ralph probably can has actually memorized all that data by now. But that's, uh, that's assuming so it's, that's that a, the earth conditions apply there. That's assuming they're, that... If they're that, sticky, it's a much steeper yeah, angle. Yeah, if, it, if it's sticky, it's unlikely it's sticky. It's more likely it's gritty. 